This week on Arizona Illustrated, the new Brian after a near-death experience. Brian is one of the most fun people I've worked with. He really believes that he will be better as long as he keeps working on it. An update on the Dunbar Pavilion. We're standing in space too. Uh, what is a really big, big, big project. And Edward J.B. Kilako, a memorial. I see everything in my mind. I draw the saloon, I draw the whole town in my mind, and then we set about to build it. Cowtown Kilako is a real West. Welcome to Arizona Illustrated. I'm Tom McNamara. Stroke is the third leading cause of death in the United States. Chances are you know someone who survived a stroke or died from one. Now, those who do survive face a new reality and an uphill climb that can lead to unexpected discoveries. Sometimes if I whisper to my fingers, they do the, what I want them to do, but usually they just go, nah. -uh. Something that used to be so easy becomes difficult later. I guess brain damage will do that to you. Yeah, then you gotta keep working on it. Yep. I play the guitar and you know the bass and also teach those things and I could read other people when they were playing a D chord I could see if they were going like this I could read off of other people and just play along with them no problem I think that's one of the more disappointing things about this, is losing that capability. But I, I also lost the capability of walking, and I can do that now. So eventually this hand will come back. You just have to have faith. It was a Saturday, and it was in the early afternoon. And so I was sitting at my drafting table, and I was leaning on my left arm, and I noticed very slowly I was coming closer and closer to the table, and I couldn't keep my, I couldn't push my arm up and get myself back up. The next thing I know, I'm in an ambulance. They put me on the, the gurney, and they're rolling me out the door and I'm thinking, I cannot do this to Julie. I mean, she's my wife, you know. I can't just leave her in the lurch. This is not a good thing. I can't, I can't die today. Then the neurosurgeon came in and he said, you know, our options are we can do nothing. And if we don't do anything, there's about a 10% chance that he'll survive and um, we could do surgery, and there's about a 10% chance that he'll survive. And I said, okay, well, can I have a few minutes to think about it? And he said, you can have about two minutes. <laughs> Even though, you know, I had all of the odds and everything from the doctor, I never had that gut feeling that he was going to die. But, you know, they take you so far, and then they say, well, we've done what we can, and so we're releasing you. 
starting next month, we are going to um, be here in this room uh, about three days a week. As a stroke expert in caring for those who are living with stroke, I hear a lot that after I left the acute rehab hospital and had to go home and live with my paralysis and my inability to speak, there was no one to reach out to. And I felt like I was kicked to the curb. You know, the doctor can diagnose and he can give the medicine, but he doesn't do the day-to-day -day, um, ideas. That's why kind of the support group. There needs to be more support. There needs to be more um, places where people of all different ages and all different um, uh, processes can go and get different kinds of therapy. I think we're still when people do not feel supported, caregivers and survivors, the likelihood of optimal recovery and the likelihood of then living a quality of life with their stroke is minimized. Depression, mood alteration, sadness, anger, feelings of isolation all hinder recovery. The physical therapist said she didn't think that he was really going to be able to walk again. And they said, okay, we've done everything we can, so you're on your own. So we said, okay, well now what are we supposed to do? One more lap. So that's how we met his personal trainer, Joe. Go, try to push me away. Ten, nine. Keep going, keep driving it up. Six, harder. Five. Yeah, you see you already went clockwise. Come on, man. Two, one, ten, Ben. I had zero experience training anybody who had a stroke at the time, but I knew that what I didn't know I'd research and I felt bad I because nobody wanted to help a, them. And I thought B, I could make a difference, so I said a, okay. To be, A, to B, as far as you can. If you can make it all the way till you touch this wall, I'm just going to kick his ass like I do with any other client and I'm going to get him the results that he pays me for. Simple as that. Come on, five more. I mean, people just take for granted the little things like waking up in the middle of the night if you have to go to the bathroom without having to wake your wife up and have her help you, turning the light switch on and off, pouring your own coffee. You just don't think about that kind of stuff until it gets taken away from you. Bring this right knee up a little more toward your chest. There we go. Now open. Now ready? 10 seconds of all you got, but you can't hold your breath. Crush, go. He had this, um, it's like leg lifts. So you lift your legs um, and you have weights attached to it. So it was crazy because I pushed this thing up and then my leg would start just jumping around. This left leg would be jumping all over the place and he'd be like, oh my God, look at that. It's all right, never let go now. I wouldn't just consider him like a client of mine. He's like a friend of mine. I genuinely Good, care about how he is, what he's turn. doing. So we're gonna turn. We're gonna turn clockwise towards me. On He's a determined yeah, person, you know? He way. obviously yeah. like yeah. taught himself how to play guitar. That's hard work. So I just think that he naturally just doesn't want to quit and give up, but it also I helps that rest. he's seen that when he puts in hard work, the results do happen. Now the fight. So give me full sit up, but don't hold your breath. Exhale on the way up. Exhale. But all he's got to do is think to himself, I went from wheelchair to walker to cane. The only next step from here is no cane and walking. So it's like that right there. I mean, like the results speak for themselves. Here we go. I have a friend and client that has a swim school. He's a swim coach and he said, hey, let's, you know, we've got to get Brian in the pool. And then he discovered this woman, Carol Lee, who is a retired physical therapist and her specialty was water therapy. And that's how this whole water therapy thing that we started came about. Brian was the inspiration. Brian is, is one of the most fun people I've worked with, and I've worked with a lot of people in 47 years, but he 
he really believes that he will be better as long as he keeps working on it. He's the poster child for let's go do it. Don't give up, don't give up every day. People who don't listen to you'll never get beyond a certain point are the people who tend to progress. We no longer should be talking about you're done with rehab, you're done with exercising, you're done with progressing. Science is now supporting that notion that recovery can continue to occur over a lifetime. Well, Brian won't give up. He absolutely refuses, and that's great because I won't let him give up. She really is my soulmate. And everything that I do is to get better so that I can help her so she doesn't have to do everything anymore. The old Brian that played guitar and, you know, fixed the house and made stuff and was a woodworker, he wasn't coming back. So I had to sit down one day, I talked to my wife, I said, you know, wait, I need to mourn that guy because he's dead, he's gone. And so I did, and you know, it was really hard because as a, as a mad man, you're, when you're growing up, you're taught not to cry. So I, I just broke down. And luckily, it was exactly what I needed. I needed to release that, you know, the old Brian, and understand that the new Brian's gonna be just as good, but it's gonna take a while. All of the doctors and nurses and everybody that helped you out. And but we got through it. It's not the end. It makes you see exactly how much you, you have to be grateful for. Okay, here we go. And I know that's so cliche. People <laughs> so talk about being first. grateful all the time now. But you really, <laughs> so. you really do see it. I mean, you feel it. Good boy. You know, coming home from yeah. work and putting on your slippers and, you know, sharing your day. Love it. Fixing dinner. Um, you know, we we do all of that kind of stuff together now, and maybe before things were moving too fast. No, their dog sounds bigger than you. Every little step along the way, you have to recognize this is, you know, something I couldn't do yesterday, but now I can. So I'm going to build on that and never give up. To learn more about stroke, go to soazstrokeresources.org. Over the next several months, AZPM will share some of the stories of Tucson's African-American people, the challenges they face, and the important contributions they make to our community. Now we look back at Edward J.B. Kilako, who passed away recently at the age of 87. He was a Vietnam and Korean War veteran, an Arizona cattle rancher, cowboy storyteller, and the founder of Cowtown Kilako, an 80-acre ranch southwest of Tucson. After experiencing racial discrimination from white ranchers when he brought his herd to auction in 1974, he built his own town as a place to market his cattle and as a tribute to the Western way of life. In this great country, out in the true west, just east of Kid Peak, below Eagle's Nest, where the awesome mountains cast a shadow so dim, lies the town of Kidako, on sweet Sheree Ring. Parts of Cowtown Kilako look like any other working ranch. Ed Kilako bought this land 20 years ago. His dream is to develop a special breed of cattle that's tough. We want him to travel, we want him to be able to fight, we want him to be able to 
survive in places where man have wrecked lands, where there's not much vegetation, where it is dry, it is hot, tea supply, rainforest, or wherever those places are. He grew up on ranches in Oklahoma and Texas, and later, after two decades in the Army, part of which was spent as a platoon sergeant, he went back to school and earned a degree in agriculture at the U of A. As a, as a civilization, and this is one nation here that don't seem to have any concern with the land whatsoever. Absolutely none. You know, they don't seem to care. Uh, the asphalt jungles and all other things that destroy all land that can reduce things, that can reduce food, but we don't seem to take that into account. Hopefully that we have an animal that can survive all the things until somehow man gets to understand that uh, this five billion uh, people and keep adding, it's going to have to eat somewhere and somehow. He used to sell his cattle at auction, and nobody associated his brand with the color of his skin. But one day he showed up with his cattle, and the bidding dropped, and he couldn't get a fair price. And so, Ed, what did you do? Well, this fella, he told me, he said, you know, you ought to build your own town and settle your cattle in your own town and, uh, when you don't like the price that we're giving. And I said, you know, that's a good idea. And so I set about to build my own town. And why so many buildings, though? Well, you know, one building would lead to another. Uh, we built the gentle mercantile, and then people want to come up and have events, and so we had to build the stage and cowboys would tell so many big tales, and so we named that theater after them. We call it the Lion Hour Theater. And we do a lot of research here, and we have people that uh, find books that's out of print. We know a lot about ancient civilizations, the ancient Native Americans, the ancient African civilizations, of Rome and these places. Cowtown Kilako is the real, real West. We are the way the West really was. He lives by the code of the West, and those who come here have to do the same thing. This is a place where hundreds of people come. And we say, we tell them, you know, Cowtown Kilako does not have a boxing ring, but it has a jail. And for a long time, our jail was a mesquite tree, an ant hole, and a bucket of honey. So we are, we are no nonsense people. We don't want to have time. If you've got an ax to grind someplace, you need to grind it somewhere else. Because two things that we don't have. We don't have fightings up here and we will not tolerate disrespecting the ladies. Those things, those things will get you in jail quicker than anything. So this is the next door cafe. That's where we make up a mule shoe coffee. <laughs> and uh, we say that mule shoe coffee, if you throw a mule shoe in it and if it floats, it's good That's to drink. Good but how do people hear about it though? You're out in the middle of nowhere. How do people know to come here? Word of mouth. Uh, people now know that Kilako Days is third weekend every October. They know that's going to happen no matter what, and no matter if it's raining, if it comes a hail or tornado, what that's going to go on. It's tradition now, and so they know that. Lots of special events take place here: rodeos, weddings, reunions, and all the proceeds go back into the town. And Ed, when did you build the saloon? Well, the saloon was sort of, believe it or not, the last thing that we started <laughs> really? to build. Uh, you, would, you would think that... Uh, That'd be the first thing, You'd right? think it would be the first thing, but... What do most people say that come through here, Ed? I mean, what seems to be the most, that impresses them the most? Well, they say that the guy that designed this must have had some sort of nightmare. <laughs> we, and he said, you must have some kind of weird imagination. They said, well, one architect. Uh, no. Uh, I see everything in my mind, and so it's not a blueprint here. I don't draw things, I draw it in my mind. I draw the saloon, I draw the whole town in my mind, and then we set about to build it. And since the tragedy at Old Tucson, Kilakos had a few offers. So now they're kicking their name Kilako around in Hollywood. That's an unfortunate thing that that happened to, to Old Tucson because uh, we don't want to see that happen to anybody. We don't ward movies off. Uh, if they want to do that, we'll be open to that. Uh, <clears throat> it looks like that we're going to have to take that up somewhere or another anyway, but we have to still bring it forth with our livestock breeding program. We'll never give that up. So, keeps you going, I suppose. And uh, When I die, they have to say, well, you know, that old fool, uh, he probably died uh, trying to accomplish something and he didn't really know what it was and maybe he was chasing something. He probably had already caught it and didn't know it. <laughs>
Early last year, the University of Arizona, community organizations, and concerned residents launched a cooperative effort that's yielding notable results near downtown Tucson. The Dunbar Pavilion is home to the city's two formerly segregated schools that closed decades ago. The property is on the National Register of Historic Places and is gradually coming back to life with new tenants. We're standing outside of the Dunbar School, the original Dunbar School built in 1918. It is adjacent to the junior high school that was built in 1948. So collectively, the two buildings create the Dunbar Pavilion. My name is Debbie Chess Maybe. I am the Community Impact Fellow for the University of Arizona School of Social and Behavioral Sciences. The junior high school, we were able to build out the remaining sides of, the, um, of that facility, which was about four classrooms. And so now we have successfully done that. Now you want to be careful with it. We moved into this upstairs space and they were able to finish renovations this last summer on some of the classrooms that had never gotten redone yet. Um, so we're, uh, we're really happy to be here. It is now time to start our quiet cleanup. I'm David Higuera, and I'm the co-director and co-founder of the Idea School. We're not going to continue until you guys are all listening. Show me that you can be good listeners. We started at the Tucson Museum okay. of Art, and then for three years we were sharing a campus with Changemaker High School in Midtown. Um, last spring, the opportunity to partner with the Dunbar Coalition opened up, and it sort of was a big revelation for all, of, all the parties involved. Go! We're looking to empower students to be in charge of their learning. Um, they're looking to rejuvenate the space that used to be the segregated school of Tucson, where all African American students were sent, and they want students to be empowered and a, a more, you know, to build a more unified future. Um, so there was good alignment, and um, yeah, we just feel blessed to be to be here. Do you need a little powder on that? This year, I started attending the school, and I like it a lot. Everyone's very nice. Can I see you now? You get to play a lot, you get to learn. So do you see what you need to do? The back of it has to be like this. We're a school that's really focused on uh, tapping into the fact that kids are intrinsically motivated learners and using that as the basis for their education. So we want them to still be as motivated by school as eighth graders uh, as they were when they were in kindergarten because the curriculum's still relevant to them. They're seeing that they get to ask the questions as well as seek out the answers. Um, and, uh, and so they, they, they still see learning as something that's not foreign to them, but from them. Some of my favorite classes are uh, science and arts, mostly uh, science and engineering. I have two grandsons, Amakai and Dalen. Amakai is in kindergarten, he's five, and Dalen is eight, he's in second grade. We wanted them in an environment that we knew that, went, that they could flourish personally and individually as well as, as corporately. And so we wanted to give it a try. And then for it to be at the Dunbar Center um, was even more exciting because we, I'm not here from Tucson, but we have heard about the history of this building. It is really wonderful to reactivate this space as a school. It started as a school, we've returned to a piece of that concept. The kids being here on a regular basis just really um, adds to that idea of what happens when you reverse the effects of segregation in schools. So if you think about it, you know, here was this historically segregated school that has now been to returned to the purposes of education. All right. Good morning. I'm calling it to order. Got it? OK. It's provided us a space where we can so, have meetings. Welcome to our the visitors. Tucson Handweavers and Spinners Tony, Guild um, has Linda their general meetings Lee. there, all of their workshops. Their study groups meet there. Um, we have our no, library there. It brings life to not only that building, but to the community. 
um, which is an old historic neighborhood. Uh, and we're happy to be part of the rebirth there and to see new things coming in. It's a sharing experience and having a home base like the Dunbar School and VTAC Center is perfect for other organizations to do the same kinds of things and for cross-fertilization. And so this is one of the blankets. This is not for a baby because I don't... It's an opportunity to meet people from many different fields when um, they are assembled there. So I just love the idea. We just moved back from New Orleans. We were there for a couple of years and it has a lot of history there. They don't knock down buildings. They still have Katrina houses that they just, you know, fix up and people get to live in. So it was really refreshing to come back and have her be in a school that has that feeling to it still. We're standing in the historic Dunbar School built in 1918. And so this is kind of the second phase of development for the entire Dunbar Pavilion. You've kind of already seen the space over on the other side, the John Spring Junior High School, which was formerly called the Dunbar Junior High School, but its name was changed in 1951 after the desegregation order. So we're now in the historic Dunbar School side. And this is kind of sacred ground, I guess you can say. This is where um, all of the history and all of the complications of what it is, what, what bigotry and segregation are, are accumulated within these walls. And so as we look at now developing this side, we're very mindful of how we treat this space, the tenants that will go into this space, the trajectory of development of this space. The whole entire pavilion is now on the um, National Register of Historic Places, which was a significant feat for us. But yes, we're standing in, in phase two of what is a really big, big, big project. Thank you for joining us here on Arizona Illustrated. I'm Tom McNamara. See you next week.